Yep. Now, we are so excited about our next speaker, uh, Ben Azadi. Uh, let me just share with you a little bit about him if you don't know him. In 2008, Ben Azadi went through a personal health transformation of shredding 80 pounds of pure fat. Ever since, Ben Azadi has been on a mission to help one billion people. I love that goal, right? Like, yep. don't start small. Like, have that goal. One billion people. We can give him a hand for that. Absolutely. Yes. yes. I want some big dreams. Ben is the author of four best-selling books, Keto Flex, The Perfect Health Booklet, The Intermittent Fasting Cheat Sheet, The Power of Sleep. Ben has been the go-to source for intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. He is known as the health detective because he investigates dysfunction and he educates, not medicates, to bring the body back to normal function. Ben is the founder of Keto Camp, a global brand bringing awareness to ancient healing strategies such as the keto diet and fasting. Ben is the host of a top 15 podcast, the Keto Camp podcast, and the fast-growing Keto Camp YouTube. YouTube channel with over 130,000 subscribers and his TikTok channel with over 155,000 subscribers. Today, he's going to be sharing about tapping into the wisdom of the body with ketosis. It's our great pleasure to introduce Ben Azadi. Thank you, too. Got it. Thank you. Good morning. They're so much fun. Uh, let's give a big round of applause for Chris, Miriam, the entire staff, the MCs, awesome. And all the people behind the scenes that we don't even see what's going on. There's a lot to, there's a lot that goes into this production. I'm grateful to be here for the first time at Keto Salt Lake, and I'm going to be talking about the innate intelligence. The timer didn't start, by the way, uh, Chris. The innate intelligence. So we'll under, we're going to get into what exactly that is. Where is it in the body? And how does these ancient healing strategies, ketosis, harness this innate intelligence so you could go and heal your body? My name is Ben Azadi. They gave a great introduction to who I am. I'm also going to get into some tips and strategies for you to follow keto in practical ways that I've implemented with thousands of students in my Keto Camp Academy. I've seen a lot of things over the years that have worked doesn't work, so I'm kind of going to give you the practical ways to apply it in your life today. So let's get into a few things here. I have a book called Keto Flex. came out a year ago, actually April of last year. I'm super proud about it. I didn't bring it here, but amazing endor endorsements from Ben Bickman, Cynthia Thurlow, Dr. Fung, Megan Ramos, and you could check out, check out the book over at ketoflexbook.com. It's available on paperback, Audible. And shout out to all the authors who narrate their own book. I did it myself, and it's a painstaking process. Yeah, sh seriously, it's, it's, it's a tough process, but it's available. And uh, I wanted to start here. Cynthia shared this study yesterday. This is in 2018, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Over 8,000 people in this study, they were looking at blood pressure. Were these people on medication, off medication, A1C, BMI, different metrics, and they came to the conclusion that 88% of American adults are metabolically unhealthy, metabolically inflexible. And then COVID hit, what do you think happened to this percentage? Did it get better or did it get worse? Yeah, it got worse, I would imagine. That means only 12% of us, not us, but in America in general, are metabolically healthy. Of course, keto, intermittent fasting, all the things you're learning this weekend from amazing speakers, it's the solution to put a dent in this. This is a disgusting stat, and we have the information, the tools, the research to take care of this, to make sure 100% of us are metabolically healthy and flexible. Diabetes is near and dear to my heart. If you know my story, I lost my dad to the complications of diabetes in 2014. And it was a very difficult time in my life, didn't understand the disease, put my faith in conventional wisdom. And my dad suffered a massive stroke, was paralyzed for nine months, and he ended up passing away. And ever since that happened, I had a lot of questions. Why did that happen to my dad? Why are so many people getting diagnosed with heart disease, diabetes, et cetera? 
And of course, I came to the answers, and I now understand that the same information I'm going to share with you today, same information that would have saved my dad's life, I get that, I live with that, but I also get that I was given that mountain so I could show the world the mountain can be moved. If you will have diabetes, if you have insulin resistance, these are conditions that can be reversed, and this is not medical advice, but I've seen it time after time after time, and many of you have done it yourself. Here are some of the stats on diabetes. It's estimated that 60% of Americans are diabetic or pre-diabetic. It's probably higher because people are not really testing and they have no idea. 68% of those diabetics end up with heart disease. 16% have a stroke. 70% end up with really damaging diabetic neuropathy. But look at that underlying sentence right there. The above statistics apply to those who are on medication. Most people don't understand just because you're taking medication, it doesn't mean you are exempt from this set of statistics. Diabetes medication may show the sugars are getting uh, better, but the diabetes is actually progressing and getting worse. Here's the truth. It's actually pretty rare to die from diabetes. What kills the person is the degeneration of that disease, the heart disease, the strokes, the kidney, the kidney disease, the amputations, the infections. More stats out there, according to you know, CDC, cancer.org, one in three women are diagnosed with cancer within their lifetime. For men, one in two. Middle stat I already gave, but look at the stat on the right. This is the projection, according to the CDC. 10 years from now, 2032, it's predicted that one in two children will be born on the autism spectrum. There's two types of people I'm categorizing in the world. We have a line, a long line of people, I'm gonna call them the 97%ers, that are looking for shortcuts, band-aids. They don't really understand cause and effect yet. And look, I was there myself being obese for 24 years. But they're looking for shortcuts, for fad diets. That's a long line. Then we have the 3%ers. How many of you are a 3%er looking for a lifestyle change? Of course you are, you're here on a Saturday. <laughs> the 3%ers are incredible. The three percenters get diagnosed with a terminal disease. Their doctor says, hey, you have six months to live. Your disease is terminal. And they go back and they look at their doctor in their eyes and they say, your ability to help me is terminal. And they go on to heal themselves. What if there was a, a different way we looked at health care? What if we sent our, doctor, our, our primary care doctor a check every month we're healthy, but as soon as we get sick, we stop payment? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be a different approach? A cool approach? Human beings are the only species smart enough to create their own food and dumb enough to eat it. <laughs> I think you would agree with that. We have these Franken foods. I mean, you just look at, even in the keto space, not the, the uh, products that are here, but in general, the keto space is filled with artificial sweeteners and rancid oils, which we'll talk about. I love this quote. It relates to a lot of Dr. Ken Berry's work and Brian's work and all the other speakers. The illiterate of the 21st century is not those who cannot read and write, but those who, who cannot learn, unlearn, and then relearn. How much, how many of the, how much of the information that we've learned over the years, whether you've gone through traditional medical system or just learning on your own, did we have to unlearn and then relearn the truth? This is, the, this is the fact here. And Einstein said, intellectuals solve problems, geniuses prevent them. We want to be proactive, not reactive. The fact that you're here today means you're a genius. You're being proactive, not reactive. I wish I would have done that for my dad. So let's talk about getting healthy, unlocking the health code. You know, the cool thing about having the combination to a code it doesn't matter if you're black, you're white, if you live in a different country, whatever symptoms you have, whatever your history is, if you have the combination to the code, you unlock the code. So this weekend, we're learning a lot about this combination. Ketosis is a big part of this combination of the, that's gonna unlock the health code so your body could heal. And we're gonna talk about this innate intelligence. Inside of your body, you have the world's greatest healer, the world's greatest physician, the world's greatest chiropractor, health coach, medical doctor. There's no pill, surgery, or supplement that could replace what you have within your cells right now. All 50 to 70 trillion cells inside your body right now. It's the inner physician called the innate intelligence. 
and it's eager to go to work for you and heal your body every single second, 24-7, 365 days a year. But we have blocked the innate intelligence. We have interference blocking this inner physician from doing its job. So where exactly is the innate intelligence? Is it in our genes? For many years we thought, hey, you were born with these certain genes. Cancer runs in your family, it's just a matter of time. Diabetes runs in your family, it's just a matter of time. And we thought the innate intelligence, the intelligence of your body was in your DNA nucleus. And then some brilliant scientists, one of them, Dr. Bruce Lipton, who I interviewed a year ago on my Keto Camp podcast, did an experiment which was followed by several other scientists to verify if his experiment was correct. What they did is they looked at cells inside of the human body. They extracted this into a Petri dish. And what they did is they removed the DNA nucleus from cells. And you would think if the intelligence was in the DNA nucleus, the cell would die instantly. But the cells lived for two months, sometimes even longer, before the cells went rogue and then eventually died off. So then they thought, okay, if it's not the DNA nucleus that the intelligence, where the intelligence lies, is it the cell membrane, which is that lipid bilayer that protects the cell and the mitochondria? So they said, let's remove the membrane and see what happens. Instant death. So to me, and to Dr. Bruce Lipton, that goes to show me that the intelligence of your cells is actually the membrane, the bodyguard of your cells that, com that communicates with the DNA nucleus. And you have a membrane around your cells and you have membrane around your mitochondria as well. Then the next question is, okay, what, what supports the membrane? What is the membrane even made of? Protein, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Not carbs, not sugar, but protein, saturated fat, and cholesterol. Those are bad words to a lot of people. <laughs> So the innate intelligence to me is actually the membrane. If we could find ways to support the membrane, the communication that's sent to the DNA, DNA is a blueprint that's red. And if you have cancer in your family or diabetes or whatever it is, it doesn't mean that's in your future. We have the ability to dim down the lights on these genes or dim up the lights, just like the lights I have here. And that's epigenetics. And Dr. Bruce Lipton believes that we have actually 99% control over the expression of our genes, which is super powerful to understand. So the membrane, he calls it the membrane, which is very appropriate, has these receptor sites. They're called integral membrane proteins, but I want you to think of the receptor sites as cell phone antennas. The job of cell phone antenna is to receive communication and produce a job. The job of these receptor sites are to receive communication from hormones, thoughts, nutrients, oxygen, for your cells to produce a specific job. There's about 30,000 receptor sites on a single cell. The membrane, these receptor sites are integrated into your membranes. And it's this amazing orchestra that's going on in your body right now. It's incredible. So here's how it works. An environmental stimulus binds to the cell membrane, these receptor sites. Chemical reaction inside the cell reaches the nucleus a gene becomes expressed as a protein. Now, that could be a healthy anti-inflammatory protein, a wonderful process, or it could be an inflammatory protein that leads to autoimmune and different conditions. So let's relate this conversation now to keto, ketosis. We know that out of the 70 trillion cells, pretty much two options for energy source, glucose or ketones. Many of the speakers already explained this. But there's three types of ketones we have, and the liver produces ketones. So basic understanding, you drop glucose and insulin by dropping your carbohydrates, your body then shifts over to an alternate fuel source, starts mobilizing body fat. Fatty acids are shuttled to your liver. Your liver burns that, uses that for energy, and then ketones are produced. And you have acetoacetate, acetone, and beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta Those are the three types of ketones. We know there's a lot of confusion in the keto space. There are thousands of different ways to do keto. You have some of the best speakers on this subject here this weekend. We are so blessed. I'm grateful to learn from them myself. But there's a lot of confusion out there. If somebody's confused, they usually don't take action. So I love that we have these amazing speakers giving you the clear research, the science, and the practical steps 
so you could take action because information doesn't change our lives. We used to have an issue of not enough information. Now we have too much information, but it's not the information that changes your life. If information changed our lives, every librarian would be a multimillionaire. It's the application of the right inf information, which I'm going to get into how I do it at Keto Camp. So we know that research is clear on what ketones do. You, it, other speakers have shared it, but you can just go on pubmed.gov and just type in keto and keto and or whatever you're looking for. The research is clear on it. I don't like to consider it a diet, although it can be, but it's more of a metabolic process. Let me go back for a second. Ketosis is, there's nothing new about keto. It's not a fad, it's a fact. It might be nuanced, but it has been around for as long as humans have existed, the proper human diet, right? It's a metabolic process. Every single one of our ancestors, they did keto. Their environment forced them into ketosis, and it's actually a great thing, which we're gonna get, get into how that works. My mentor, Dr. Pampa, said, if you wanna get well, you gotta fix the cell. So I'm going to get into how ketones actually work with the cells and the mitochondria, and then I'm going to get into some practical tips that I apply to my students. And the last five minutes or so of the talk is probably the most important part of the talk, which ties everything together. So make sure you stick around for that part. The mitochondrion, which is a single mitochondria. We had many speakers already talk about the mitochondria. It's the, the factory of your cells, the battery of your cells that produces energy. It's very important to understand the mitochondria and how it works. Question for you, and the speaker can't, can't answer this because they probably know the answer, but what do you think in your body, different cells, which cells have the highest concentration of mitochondria? Brain cells. Brain cells, how many do they have? Uh, uh, A lot. <laughs> uh, um, which part of the brain cell? Diffuse. Yeah. So which, the highest concentration in the brain cells is, you're right, over 2 million mitochondria in certain regions of the brain. But then you have different parts of the body. The ovaries have about 100,000 mitochondria in a single cell. The heart is loaded with them. Other cells have hundreds of thousands. But the reason I share this is because the number one priority for the human body, the innate intelligence, is survival. The cells that have the highest concentration of mitochondria are the cells most required for survival, the brain. You need to be able to focus, think, catch a predator, run away. Ovaries, reproduction, of course, survival. The heart. And the, the, the human body is incredible. I always say you are a masterpiece because you are a piece of the master. The way you were built and created is so magnificent. And the way ketones work with the mitochondria is also incredible. I'm going to get into that. Mitochondrial dysfunction is linked to a lot of diseases out there. Whole list out of them right here, but there's more to it than what this is showing here. But if you have unhealthy mitochondria, chances are you're going to feel unhealthy and symptoms are in your future or they're probably right now. Basic understanding is that the mitochondria receives fuel sources, glucose, fatty acids, amino acids, and that produces ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So think of ATP as energy currency, the gasoline of your cells. If the mitochondria is the engine of your vehicle, think of the ATP as the gasoline that powers that vehicle. But there's also a new perspective on the mitochondria, which is super fascinating. The mitochondria are not, are not just mindless energy producers. They have, there's an intelligence in your mitochondria. They actually act as surveillance systems to identify stressors in your environment, in your body. Robert Navu, I hope I'm saying his last name right, he has great research on, Navio is how you say it, he has great research on Wartime metabolism, peacetime metabolism. If your body is in a stressful state, and that could be from excessive glucose and insulin, toxicity, mold, like Brian was sp speaking about, or whatever it is, the, the mitochondria sees that surveillance system and it reduces energy production. This is called wartime metabolism, meaning chronic fatigue, energy issues, symptoms. But if the mitochondria has surveil, uh, has, the surveillance system has determined, actually, we're in a peacetime metabolism. There's not a lot of stress. There's the right amount of stress. It's going to produce the right amount of energy. 
This is a great slide which shows exactly what happens. Cell danger response from my friend Dr. Jockers. Mitochondria are well known for the production of cellular energy. The CDR, which is cellular danger response, views a dual role of the mitochondria as energy sensors and cell defense agents under CDR. The mitochondria turn down energy production and increase oxidative activity in a stressful environment. A healthy cell produces optimal energy, homeostasis, and buffers oxidative stress. But when your cell, when your mitochondria are perceiving too much stress, it's problematic. So when you feel fatigued and inflamed, it is a purposeful, very intelligent response from your mitochondria to protect cells and tissues from the body due to infections, toxins, chemicals, trauma. And that could be mental stress, by the way. Healthy cell, we know, functions well, produces ATP. You thrive. Unhealthy cell produces little energy, and there's high reactive oxygen species, and the, and the cell can't protect itself from that inflammation. It's estimated that by the age 70, 70% 70 of mitochondria is lost. So how does this relate to glucose and ketones? This is the great news here. If a cell is using glucose, I'm going to compare that to this beat-up car, right? What is going to get you farther here? Obviously, it's the car on the right. It looks pretty badass, too. That's going to get you farther. I mean, if you look at the electron transport system, chain, excuse me, a molecule of glucose will give you 32 to 36 ATP. A molecule of ketones will give you 120 to 160 ATP. Interesting. And that's because of what Amy spoke about. That's because of mitogenesis. When you are in ketosis, when you're using ketones, it actually creates more mitochondria, which produces more energy. But this, asks, this begs the next question. Because when your cells, when your mitochondria produce ATP, it also produces free radicals. So when I, if I burned firewood here, there would be smoke. So think of reactive oxygen species as smoke. So you would think if... The mito if ketones are causing the mitochondria to produce more ATP, but more ATP creates more smoke, and that there's a high demand for that, it, sh it should be an issue, because there's a high cost to ATP production. <laughs> and it sounds like it's problematic. <laughs> but here's the difference, and this is awesome. When the mitochondria are only burning glucose, it's not using ketones, can't keep up with the free radicals produced. It's like having one fireman for an entire building that's lit on fire. When your cells are using, when the mitochondria are using ketones, it's having a whole fleet on call, ready to put out the fire. So yeah, you're producing more energy, more fire, more smoke, but you're putting it out. You're protecting, the mitochondria is protecting themselves. That's what ketones do. And of course, Dr. Bickman has research on this. Other speakers have research on this. That's why when you look at research out there that shows a ketogenic diet lowers free radicals, lowers inflammation, you've seen it yourself probably, it makes sense. And I'm not gonna fly through these studies, but you could take quick uh, screenshots here if you want. By the way, I could give you my slides if you want. I'll give you the entire deck. Just email me, support at ketocamp.com, keto uh, camp with the K, and I'll give you the whole deck, so I'm gonna fly through these. And here's a study that was done by uh, John Ramsey and Newman, Buck Institute, UC Davis, and they showed in mice that it actually extended lifespan. They duplicated the study. So it makes sense. This also showed that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, histone deacetylase inhibitor. So all these studies are showing it lowers free radicals, and it makes sense because of the um, mitochondria aspect here. But this study is interesting. Therapeutic potential of ketone bodies for patients with cardiovascular disease. However, evidence from both experimental and clinical research has uncovered a protective role for ketones and cardiovascular disease. Although ketones may provide supplemental fuel for the energy-starved heart, their cardiovascular effects appear to extend far beyond a cardiac energetics. Indeed, ketone bodies have been shown to influence a variety of cellular processes, including gene transcription, inflammation, oxidative stress, and endothelial function, cardiac remodeling, and cardiovascular risk factors. And here's why, and this is the analogy I got from Dr. Gundry when I interviewed him. 
I don't agree with everything Gundry says, but I love this analogy here. So ketones act as that signaling molecule. So the way that it works, here's the analogy for it to make a lot of sense. A pressure cooker. When there's too much steam in a pressure cooker, you have that release valve that releases any excess steam. When ketones are being produced by your body, when you have ketones in your body, it's signaling to your mitochondria to uncouple and get rid of any excess free radicals. This is the mechanism how ketones actually communicate with your cells. So who do you want protecting your cells? McLovin from Superbad or the Secret Service? Of course, we want ketones protecting our cells. So let's get into some practical steps here. We are designed to burn fat. Burning fat is our primal birthright. Babies that are breastfed go in and out of ketosis. Breast milk has saturated fat, uh, cholesterol, and there's glucose, but the baby is so efficient at burning the glucose, it taps in and out of ketosis. Why? It helps the development of that baby's brain. The brain is mostly fat. So burning fat is our primal birthright. But what happens 2022, or this day and age, we have a keto deficiency. So throughout much of human evolution, ketosis likely served as a valuable survival mechanism to fuel brain metabolism during times of food scarcity. Hence, in some ways, the modern diet can be considered keto deficient. What we have, the 88% of people who are metabolically unhealthy, it is a keto deficiency. So I'm going to get into these terms. Some people don't like the term clean versus dirty, but it helps, it helps me separate it here. I interviewed two incredible people, Dr. Kay Shanahan and a gentleman named Brian Peskin. And we got into this topic here, smoking cigarettes versus vegetable oil. So Dr. Kay Shanahan, she was the nutritionist for the Los Angeles Lakers when Kobe Bryant was there. She introduced Kobe Bryant and Dwight Howard to bone broth, got them off of seed oils. She wrote Deep Nutrition, Fat Burn Fix. She's awesome. And then Brian Pesk, an MIT researcher. And I asked them both the same question. Is it worse to smoke cigarettes or eat seed oils? And Brian Peskin said, well, according to my research, Peskin's research, he said, if somebody smoked two packs of cigarettes every single day for 28 years, the chances of that person developing cancer within the 28 years, lung cancer, is about 16%. Then he said, if somebody consumed cooked vegetable oils every day for 28 years, the chances of them developing heart disease or cancer within those 28 years is about 86%. Interesting, that's just one man's research. So I asked Dr. Kate Shanahan if this lined up with her research. I gave her the exact stats I just showed you. And she said, actually, Ben, that 86% is closer to 100%. We know seed oils. Um, I have a video. I think I have time to play it. Yeah, could you play this video here? It's going to show you the production of how seed oils are made, or canola oil specifically. So if you could play that. Okay, so it's, it's okay. I want you to go on YouTube later and type in how canola oil is made. If we can't get it to play, watch the video. So these are vegetable oils. They're called linoleic acid. They're very unstable. And this shows the processing of it and what they do to bleach it, deodorize it, high pressure, high heat, makes it highly inflammatory. So they're called polyunsaturated fatty acids. Poly means many. They have many double bonds, if you look at the chemical structure. So it has many opportunities to attract oxygen and oxidize. If I bit into an apple, it's not keto friendly, but if I bit into an apple and I left it here and came back tonight, there would be oxidation in that apple, some browning. That's kind of what's happening at the cellular level when we eat these fats. Watch the video later, but here's some studies that back this up. Dietary polyunsaturated fatty acids and cancers of breast colorectum. Persistent oxidative stress often involving enhanced peroxidation of PUFAs, these are these vegetable oils, in the cell membranes are known to enhance the development of malignant diseases. Thus, the carcinogenic process could be initiated and or accelerated by lipid peroxidation induced DNA and protein damage. So Kate Shanahan, Dr. Kate Shanahan says, PUFAs go poof. They oxidize. They're highly unstable, highly inflammatory. This one looked at linoleic acid in LDL. So this article shows that linoleic acid increases endothelial dysfunction and inflammatory marker expression. 
It also asserts that diabetics have more linoleic acid in their LDO particles than non-diabetics. Corn oil induces changes to cardiac fatty acids and causes early diastolic dysfunction without altering systolic function. This is a very fascinating study. Everybody go check it out. They wanted to look at what the mitochondria, how the mitochondria use different fats, saturated fats, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats. And it essentially showed, and I'm kind of paraphrasing the bottom here, but go look, at, look it up. The mitochondria cannot use PUFAs for energy production anywhere near the way it can be used. It could use monounsaturated fats or saturated fats. So I put there PUFAs equal cell death. It's estimated that the half-life, let me ask you this question. What do you think the half-life is for linoleic acid in your, your body? 18 months. 18 months. Five years. Five years. Anybody else want to guess? It's about two years. Yeah, you were close. On average, two years. Meaning, if we got rid of all these vegetable oils today, in about two years, half of it will remain in our body fat but we still want to get rid of them today because we're going to live a long life. So let's, and we want to limit them as much as possible. So I'm going to give you a list here. This is just on Wikipedia showing the blue is the one that's PUFAs, linoleic acid, the highest concentration, very unstable. But let me give it to you in a better list here. Uh, the reason is because they shut down oxygen transfers, the processing of them. That video will show you that. But here's the list. We want to avoid these. Canola, corn, soybean, cottonseed, safflower, peanut, sunflower, grapeseed, fish oil, and rice bran oil. Fish oil, I'm not a fan of fish oil. It's a polyunsaturated fat. So when I go to restaurants, my fiance, I drive her crazy because I always ask the waiter or waitress, hey, what do you cook your food in here? And canola, soybean, even the fanciest restaurants. What I say, and this is what I recommend you say, hey, I'm allergic. Everybody at this table is allergic to vegetable oil. Can you use real olive oil or butter or, or something else? And they usually say, yeah. So that little, little tip right there, you, it might be uncomfortable, but the more you do it, you get comfortable. It goes a long way. These are going to create a lot of inflammation in the body. We want to switch those for, where am I pointing this? There we go. We want to switch those for monounsaturated fats and saturated fats. You already know this, olive oil, avocado oil, ghee, duck fat, butter, lard, coconut oil, and beef towel. These are much more stable and healthy for that cell membrane so your innate intelligence could do its job. Now, a big part of keto is the liver. Okay, Nurse Cindy talked about this, but the liver, I call the liver the soccer mom organ because it does everything for us. <laughs> it's like working all the time, everything, all the time. But the number one thing I've seen with people who transition to keto from a standard American diet is sluggish bile. So when you think about the liver, it produces bile, which I call liquid gold. Bile is important to break down fat and for detoxification. And a lot of people have beat up that soccer mom liver through alcohol, medications, toxins, high processed foods. So now they eat more dietary fat, but they can't produce the quality bile to break it down. They feel awful and they say, that keto thing didn't work for me. So we wanna support the liver with bitters. Bitters for the liver. So I always recommend this for people, especially new to keto, but it also makes a difference in general, whether you've been doing keto for two to five years, support that liver with bitter. So anything on this list right here is a good stimulant for that liver to produce bile. These are downstream, easy things we can incorporate. Have a few of these each day. And if you really have some liver issues going on, of course, work with somebody, but you could do things like coffee enemas, something called a PC push, which, which is phosphatidylcholine and do some other things to support the liver, like castor oil packs. But this is very easy to do. Most people could do that on a daily basis. Pro tip. I've noticed when I removed these higher oxalate vegetables and nuts from the diet of my students, they feel better. And we looked at some inflammatory markers, their HRV aura ring. So for 30 days, maybe this might be a good tip for you. Remove spinach and almonds. And um, I know there's spinach and almonds in a lot of keto foods and keto bars, but they're higher in oxalates and a lot of people have leaky gut and it could be inflammatory. So that could be a pro tip for you. And swap them for walnuts, pecans, Brazil nuts, peely nuts, macadamia nuts. Those are much better options. Replace spinach with arugula, dandelion greens, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. I've seen that make a difference for my students. Another pro tip, Dr. Ken Berry speaks about this a lot. Cow dairy could be inflammatory for a lot of people. I think it's what, 75% of uh, American adults can't really process cow dairy efficiently. 
So we want to switch over to sheep and goat. Much better. The body is going to tolerate that much better. But here's something interesting about sheep dairy and goat dairy. 30% of sheep and goat dairy is actually MCTs, MCT oil, which actually could help your body produce more ketones because the unique thing about medium chain triglycerides bypasses digestion, doesn't require bile, goes right into the mitochondria for energy use. So goat and sheep, much better. H other hidden sources of inflammation on keto, legumes like uh, hummus and peanut butter. I know I love peanut butter, but it doesn't agree with me. Corn, soy, burning your meat, farm fish, nightshades, just be aware of those. Artificial sweeteners, we'll get into that real quick. Here's a list of the ones that I'm not a big fan of, especially sucralose and aspartame. Few studies out there. This was looking at how sucralose, which is in Splenda, moves through the human body, and they could only account for 96.7% of it, meaning after tracing it, 3.3% of it was untraceable. Is it turning into an unusual metabolite, or is it bioaccumulating somewhere in the body? We don't know. That's the weird thing right there. Where is it going? Now, in some people, sucralose could raise glucose and insulin, and some it doesn't. This study showed in 17 obese women that it did for some, but in others it didn't, so it'll be variable. Uh, this is looking at what it does to the gut, right? Brian spoke about the gut. Gut microbiome is so important. What happens in the gut happens in the brain and vice versa. And this study published in Nature 2014 examined what happened to different groups of mice fed three different artificial sweeteners, saccharin, sucralose, aspartame as compared to mice fed normal sugars, glucose, and sucrose. sucrose. War warringly, all of the mice that were fed the artificial sweeteners quickly developed glucose intolerance, a harbinger of uh, diabetes, obesity, and metabolic disease by altering the gut microbiota. And these studies show it could be dangerous to cook with, affects gut bacteria, may cause weight gain. So there's a lot of studies out there. Some of it is mixed, but much safer to switch over to these Monk fruit, stevia, and erythritol. A lot of these companies here have this in their products. Now, how do you measure ketones? This is the topic of uh, debate here. Funny story, I was speaking in Orlando last year at the Keto Orlando Summit, and I was doing this exact presentation here about well, the slide. And I was saying there's three different ways to test. You have beta hydroxybutyrate in the blood, acetoacetate in the urine, acetone in the breath. I'm not a big fan of acetoacetate maybe in the first few days, but when your body and your cells are actually efficient at using ketones, it's not really going to spill out in the urine, and it could give you a false negative. And the funny story about this is there was a vendor in the actual room selling urine strips <laughs> when I said this. But I like Keto Mojo. They're here. They're awesome. Dorian and Gemma. I use them all the time. I also like Biosense, but Keto Mojo I'm going to talk about more because I use that more with my students. So here's what I've seen work best for thousands of students that I put through this protocol. Fasting glucose, somewhere between 70 and 90. Blood ketones, we don't want to chase ketones, we want to chase results. But the sweet spot I've seen for people to feel really good, even myself, is somewhere between 0 0.8 and 2.8. For in there most of the time, I think you're going to feel good. Now, Amy just spoke about something very important. Looking at your postprandial Glucose, very important. I wear a CGM all the time. I'm always looking at this, but you could do it with the Keto Mojo as well. An hour after eating, we want that postprandial glucose to be 120 milligrams per deciliters or below. Two hours after eating, we want your glucose to drop below 100. If you're seeing this on a day-to-day -day basis, it's a good sign. But if you're seeing that glucose stay higher than that, there's some other work you got to do, some uh, things you got to work on. If you're having trouble producing ketones, two scientifically proven ways. Number one, caprylic acid, which is uh, MCT oil, C8. These three studies show that it helped increase plasma ketone response. And then caffeine, my co fellow coffee drinkers, good news for you. <laughs> this study showed it also could help uh, produce ketones. So add a little bit of some MCT in your coffee. That could enhance ketone production. Just don't do too much too soon with the MCTs because it could send you to the bathroom with an upset stomach or some even worse than that. But that could help produce ketones. Final thoughts, and I made it just in time to give you the best part of the, I believe, the presentation. Okay. We are only limited by weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. Neville Goddard said that. I believe that we could do all the keto and intermittent fasting, get our macros right, go to CrossFit, Orange Theory, but if we don't have 
the inner sizing going on, the exercising doesn't matter. The inner work is foundational. It's great to have a physical six pack, that's cool. But what about a mental six pack? That's more important than a physical six pack any day of the week. And this quote right here is super powerful. I'm gonna talk about weakness of attention and poverty of imagination. So let me ask you this question. How many thoughts does the average person have every single day? What do you think? <laughs> Actually, not more than the mitochondria. How many thoughts? What do you think? How many? It's in the thousands. 10,000, 25,000? Over 9,000. So it's estimated by psychologists that the average person has upwards of 60,000 thoughts per day. And it's estimated that 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts that we had yesterday. <laughs> and they estimate that 85% of those thoughts are negative thoughts. What I call, I learned this from Zig Ziglar, stinking thinking. And I got news, if your thinking is stinking, your dreams are shrinking. Health, financial, relationships. So we want to become aware of those thoughts because if your thoughts actually have the ability, and this has been proven by Dr. Bruce Lipton, your thoughts are a frequency that could penetrate the cell membrane and communicate with your DNA. This is a fact. Now, if it's a negative thought, a stinking thinking thought, that communication sent to your DNA will be an inflammatory protein that's produced from our thoughts. But if it's a loving, abundant, grateful thought, that signal sent to your DNA produces an anti-inflammatory protein. This means 60,000 thoughts per day, you have 60,000 opportunities to put your body in a healing state every single day. The greatest power you have as human beings is your ability to choose your own thoughts. Animals don't have this ability. This is our greatest power. But if we're not aware of those thoughts, if we're the 90% of the thoughts today are the same thoughts from yesterday, we're not going to be able to harness this. So how many of you talk to yourself during the day? Raise your hand. So those of you who didn't raise your hand, you're thinking, do I talk to myself? I think I talk to myself. I'm not sure if I talk to myself. We do, but I want to give you an example here of how a lot of people are not aware of those thoughts, okay? There's a word called silk, S-I-L-K, silk, and we're going to repeat that word silk out loud five times in a row, and then I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer that question as quickly as possible. So on the count of three, we'll say silk out loud five times. One, two, three. Silk, 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 silk. What do cows drink? Milk. Gotcha. <laughs> they drink water, right? Look, when I first did this, I said milk. But that's just a silly example of how our thoughts are getting away from us and how we want, because look, out there, this, the cards are stacked against us, right? Mainstream news, the social media. I mean, we are bombarded with things that are weakening our attention and getting us away from our ability to create and manifest our own thoughts. You are the most influential person you'll speak to today. George Bernard Shaw said 2% of the population think, 3% of the population think they think, and 95% of the population would rather die than think. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So in combination with that is a vitamin that we could take every single day. It's a supplement. It's called vitamin G. And it's been proven to put your body in a healing state as soon as you take it. Dr. Joe Dispenza has shown with brain scans on thousands of people that when you take vitamin G, 1,200 different chemical processes and reactions occur instantaneously that put your body in an anti-inflammatory state of restoring the body back to homeostasis with this supplement. It's vitamin gratitude. It's the strongest vitamin in the world. I have not missed practicing gratitude. Ask my fiance. I have notepads that are filled, probably 30 of them, with just gratitude. Every night before bed, every morning, I write down what I'm grateful for because the universal law states what you feed energy to expands. 
It's a universal law, whether you think this is woo-woo or not. I could say gravity is a universal law, and you could say that's woo-woo, and then I could just drop this right in front of you. It's, it's the truth. It's a fact. Universal laws can't argue, just like gratitude, just like what you feed energy to expands, because what you appreciate appreciates. So I highly encourage you, yeah, take all the tips you're learning here, incredible information, apply it and take action, but do the inner work. Write down something you're grateful for. Express gratitude to somebody today that you appreciate. Express it to yourself, the fact that you're alive, the fact that your heart is beating, because guess what? On average, 150,000 people die every single day in this world. The fact that we're alive today, everybody put your hand over your heart, take a deep breath, let it out, feel that beat. That's something to be grateful for because 150,000 people struggled to do that yesterday and they lost that battle. Same thing today. So when you find yourself flustered or pissed off because of whatever, the economy, politics, or you're, not, you're just not getting the results you want, think of that number, 150,000. The fact that you're alive is a blessing. The fact that we live in America is a blessing. There's so much to be grateful for. And what you appreciate, appreciates. And what you think about, and what you think about, you bring about. My mentor, Bob Proctor, recently passed away. He said, thoughts become the things. If you could see it in your mind, you could hold it in your hands. So I want to encourage you to develop a gratitude practice. I want to encourage you to become aware of those 60,000 thoughts. Because it's really tricky. It's when you're walking your dog and washing dishes, brushing your teeth. What are you thinking at that moment? When a stinking, thinking thought comes in, think of that as a cloud with all this thunder and let it pass. And then choose a thought that's going to serve you right now and serve your future self. That's your greatest power. And when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Dr. Wayne Dyer said that. So I hope this resonates with you. I hope this made a big difference for you. If you want to learn more about me, I have my Keto Camp YouTube channel, at the Benazadi on Instagram, at the Benazadi on TikTok, Keto Camp Podcast. I'll be here all weekend to watch the other speakers, and I want to say thank you. I'm grateful for your energy and your enthusiasm, and you're amazing, and I'm so grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.